Hi, this is the Tropical Tidbit for Monday evening, August 24th. As always, the thoughts here are mine alone, and please consult the National Hurricane Center and your local NWS office when making decisions about what to do as the storms approach. We're still watching our two storms, and we've had one impacting land today, Tropical Storm Marco. You can see the low-level circulation here, and as we discussed yesterday, we have seen a decoupling of the circulation as southwesterly wind shear has pushed all of the thunderstorm activity off to the northeast and now the low-level center has become decoupled from that convection and is now drifting westward along with the low-level flow and uh, fortunately this has led to hurricane warnings and tropical storm warnings being dropped by the nhc for this section of coastline so this has been a stroke of fortune where we're having less direct impacts from wind and storm surge although it is still a breezy day along the section of coastline and we have had flash flooding potential from all the heavy rain on the northeast side in alabama and parts of the florida panhandle today so this will continue to decay as it moves toward the west and weather will eventually clear up in this part of the Gulf Coast. And Marco's remnants may play a role in the forecast for our other storm, Tropical Storm Laura, which is down here. And we're going to start talking about Laura now for the remainder of the video. And we've seen the storm come across uh, the eastern part of Cuba last night, crossed the mountains, very tall mountains in this part of the island, disrupted the circulation rather significantly. But since that time, uh, from this morning onward, it's been passing over the water and has now ended up here uh, in this little niche north of the Isle of Youth. And this time over water has, has allowed the storm to become better organized today. And as we look at the closer floater imagery, we see that plenty of thunderstorm activity is occurring to the south of the center that is currently somewhere in here and you can see some bursts occurring also on the east and now wrapping around to the northern side and uh, this is important because the storm has been experiencing a little bit of mid-level shear out of the north and that's because the low-level steering flow remains basically what you see here over the Florida Straits the southeasterly wind that we've had and that's been quite strong, by the way, tropical storm warnings up in the Florida Keys today. But the mid-level flow is more out of the due easterly direction. And so with these flows crossing like this, what you end up with is a northerly shear over the storm when you take the difference between those two. And so we've had most of the thunderstorm activity on the southern side during the last 24 hours. That's now starting to wrap around more toward the north side as we go into the evening hours, which is a sign of organization. We can see this on the Cuban radar as well, where we see a nice well-defined curl occurring now on the radar imagery. And you can see this moving generally toward the west-northwest during the last couple of hours maybe a slight leftward bend than we've had for the last couple, perhaps moving more like this now as we head throughout the evening. And we've had tropical storm conditions throughout Western Cuba where winds as high as 60 miles per hour may occur at times. Now, Laura has been over water today, but will move over land one more time before eventually hitting the United States in a couple of days. It's going to move over this tip of Cuba tonight, where there are some mountains. Now, these will probably disrupt this uh, inner core that's trying to form here once more, but this is probably only going to amount to a speed bump in Laura's organization as Laura is moving quite fast, and this is only a small strip of land. So so as soon as this gets out over the Gulf of Mexico, it's probably not going to take very long for it to organize and begin strengthening again. As we have had an organizing inner core today, we haven't had recon data in there to see exactly how strong this is, but the pressure up in Havana is down to 1,004 millibars, and given how far that is away from where the center appears to be right now, we probably have a pressure below 1,000 millibars indicating a strengthening tropical storm relative to what the aircraft found this morning. Uh, when it was a little bit more disorganized. So we probably have a strengthening storm that will hit Cuba, have a little bit of a speed bump, and then resume intensification over the Gulf. And the question then becomes, as this moves across the warm waters of the Gulf, will it encounter anything that can hinder it before hitting the United States? The environment is generally favorable. Is there anything there that could slow it down? Maybe a couple of wrinkles in uh, Laura's way. Uh, first of all, we have uh, the ocean heat content ahead of it. This basically measures how deep the warm water is because while the surface is warm, it also needs to be warm over a certain depth in order to support stronger hurricanes. So since we're expecting Laura to become a strong hurricane, this becomes relevant. 
we do have a little bit of a cold pool sitting out ahead of it in the central Gulf of Mexico and possibly a little cooler due to the passage of Marco, which moved over this area as well, which may have cooled the water over a small strip uh, in the north-south direction. But keep in mind, Laura is also moving rather quickly and perpendicular to this strip, and so it will pass over the patch of cooler water rather quickly. And so this might amount to a little bit of a hindrance, uh, but it's not expected to be a big one, if at all. And on the other side of this region, all of this part of the Gulf of Mexico is quite warm and deep. So unfortunately, during the final day and a half until landfall, oceanic conditions are quite favorable for Laura. So how about atmospheric conditions? Well, if we look at the GFS and we take a sounding around the storm, we talked about some of that northerly shear that's happening. And again, this is because if we just focus on the profile of wind barbs here, showing basically the steering flow at different heights. If you look at the lower level steering flow in this box here, you can see that that's out of the southeasterly direction. And again, in the mid levels, we have more of a due easterly flow. And again, if you take these two together, what you end up with is if this is the mid-level one and this is the low-level one, then this is a northerly shear when you draw the vector between the two. This is something that's going to persist as Laura crosses the Gulf. So if you watch the flow in these two boxes here, the lower atmosphere and the middle atmosphere, you're gonna see as we go forward on the GFS that this remains this way with southeasterly flow at the bottom easterly flow in the middle even as this moves into the gulf now the storm is not going to necessarily fail to intensify because of this shear because we know from experience that in a thermodynamically favorable environment with warm water moisture and no strong flow aloft uh, the storm will likely intensify despite this moderate shear, but there is a shear nonetheless And it could potentially cause hiccups in the organization of Laura's inner core and we'll watch carefully for that to see if it delays Laura getting strong or prevents it from getting as strong as it potentially could as this continues toward the North Gulf Coast What you'll see happen here is because we talked about that trough over Texas that is causing Southerly or southwest flow aloft that's going to steer Laura toward the coast And so you're going to see the flow in this middle box change suddenly from easterly to westerly or southwesterly as the storm is making landfall because it's encountering that trough and now the shear changes to one that is out of the westerly direction right near the time of landfall now this does occur quite late so it's probably too late to weaken laura significantly if the track was to continue north and we were still watching the storm before hitting landfall this shear would eventually weaken laura but it happens right near the time of landfall so it doesn't really have time to weaken laura and additionally it's important to note that when this shear flips here between here and here there's a short window where this mid-level flow is lighter. It's, n it's neither out of the east nor out of the southwest and it's quite light. And that window could be the point where Laura experiences the lowest shear in the half day or so prior to landfall. And unfortunately, this could mean that Laura reaches its peak intensity just before or at the time of landfall. And this emphasizes the danger of this situation that Laura is expected to get intense and will likely become its most intense uh, right at the time when it's going to be impacting land. So do take this storm seriously as you see these forecasts evolve over the next couple of days. So we'll watch for those couple of bumps, maybe that cold patch of water and the mid-level shear. We'll see if it holds Laura down a little bit, but in general, we're expecting a potentially major hurricane here in the Gulf of Mexico. And now, of course, the question is where will this hit the coastline? And there are still some subtleties at work. If we look at the water vapor imagery here over the United States, the primary steering features for Laura down here near western Cuba are as follows. This big mid-level ridge that's nosing in over Florida, you can see that here in the dark gray on the satellite picture, that is currently directing the storm toward the west-northwest. This ridge is going to continually build more and more westward over the next couple of days as Marco clears out of the region over here and that's going to continue forcing Laura west-northwest across the Gulf. But we have this upper-level trough over Texas that I was mentioning when we were talking about the shear. And this is going to set the edge of this ridge so that by the time Laura crosses the Gulf, we'll have a ridge nosing in over Louisiana and that trough over Texas. This will eventually force Laura to turn toward the Gulf Coast, somewhere near Upper Texas or Western Louisiana. And this is, again, 
some subtlety because exactly where this turn occurs is important. It may be that we have a couple of adjustments still left to make in the model forecast regarding exactly how Marco has decayed today because the thunderstorm activity associated with Marco's remnants may modulate how quickly this ridge builds westward. That could matter. And it may be that models which struggled with Marco may still need to take some of that into account. And in addition, we've seen some observations today from the GFS uh, looking at this ridge on the 18Z analysis at 2 p.m. This is where the ridge is on the model. We've seen some indications that perhaps this ridge is stronger than modeled from the weather balloons that were launched at 2 p.m. this afternoon, as well as the drop sons from the G4 aircraft that is flying around uh, Laura right now as we speak. So it's possible that there are some adjustments left to be made in these forecasts for how strong this ridge is. A stronger ridge would promote perhaps a farther west track that could still threaten the upper Texas coastline instead of southwest Louisiana. Now, right now, the model consensus is in southwest Louisiana, and I want to show you this map because you're going to see maps like this a lot, the so-called spaghetti charts that show this tight clump of models into southwest Louisiana. This may give an indication of certainty that is slightly misleading. This tightly clumped set of tracks does not guarantee that the landfall will be precisely here, and the actual uncertainty in the forecast is larger than what it looks like visually here, and it's possible that we have tracks a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left of this. And in particular, I want to emphasize that there is still risk to the upper Texas coastline, and you should not sleep on this storm as it is still possible that it comes farther west. There are some other models, for example, the European Ensemble, that still show a solution that is much farther left than some of the other guidance and still puts the Houston-Galveston metro at significant risk, as well as other portions of the central to upper Texas coastline. The UK Met Ensemble also shows this possibility. And again, as I said, it's possible that the ridge steering the storm is a little stronger than predicted on some of the models, so we're going to have to keep a close eye on that. We can compare the difference between uh, the GFS and the Euro Ensemble, for example, by looking at the strength of that ridge directly. And you can see this here, if we look at the forecast for Wednesday morning on the GFS Ensemble, you can see the ridge outlined here with this contour through Alabama and Laura down here. Or if, whereas if we look at the European Ensemble, you can see that that line is much farther to the west over Louisiana. On the GFS, it was here, indicating a weaker ridge on the GFS, stronger one on the European Ensemble. And that's probably why the storm ends up over Texas instead of Louisiana on this model. So you can see there's still disagreement, therefore still uncertainty about exactly where Laura will come ashore. And so while the official forecast right now does show a landfall in Louisiana, just keep in mind that it's possible that we will see changes in the forecast even though we're two days out and we're getting closer now and certainty will increase. We haven't yet pinned it down precisely. So even if you're to the left of the cone here, I would not be assuming that you will not be impacted. I would still be getting prepared if you're on the central and upper Texas coastlines for a potential hurricane impact. For now, this is the official forecast where the model consensus currently is into southwestern Louisiana sometime late Wednesday night. This shows 2 a.m. on Thursday central time or eastern time rather. This would be 1 a.m. central actually on this graphic. Uh, but keep in mind that uh, adverse impacts will arrive well in advance of the eye. This forecast is for where the eye will be, and so you could see dangerous weather as early as Wednesday morning. So make sure you have your preparations done before Wednesday morning. You basically have Tuesday to prepare, and that's going to be about it at this point. Now, we do have a hurricane watch from the Hurricane Center from the Houston-Galveston area to uh, uh, Morgan City, Louisiana, and again, there may still potentially be risk even to the left of that depending on whether or not we see the track shift left a bit. So just be prepared if you're along the Texas coastline and also in eastern Louisiana. We could also see rightward shifts. There's still a little bit of uncertainty left, so just keep that in mind. Hurricanes are tough creatures to predict. Be ready in case it comes your way and have a plan of action. And especially if you're in a storm surge zone, if you need to evacuate, know if that's going to happen. And if officials tell you to leave, please heed those orders. This is the peak surge forecast from the NHC showing the potential for 7 to 11 feet of uh, above normally dry ground inundating parts of southwestern Louisiana with 
lesser but still dangerous values of several feet above dry ground as far east as southeast Louisiana, and then of course Galveston Bay. Now realize too that these values in Galveston Bay will be significantly higher if the track is farther to the left than currently forecast, farther to the west I should say. So keep in mind that storm surge could be a significant life-threatening hazard uh, near and east of the landfall point. And we're also worried about the potential for inland flooding due to the swath of rain that always comes with hurricanes and will likely affect portions of eastern Texas, Louisiana, and even up inland into Arkansas and the rest of the Mississippi River Basin as the storm makes landfall. So this is a multifaceted hazard. Again, we're talking about a strong hurricane. Right now, the, the National Hurricane Center forecast is for maximum winds of about 105 miles per hour at the time of landfall. That's a category two hurricane. This is probably on the lower side of what the potential of Laura is. It could very well be a category two, but it has a high ceiling. In other words, the uncertainty range is probably between category two and category four at highest. So you should be preparing as if this is going to be a category four hurricane, as that is probably on the table. It's possible it could be a three or a four. So prepare accordingly. This is a significant and life-threatening event. So pay attention to the NHC and your local National Weather Service office for the most accurate information about impacts to your local area. That's it for now. Stay safe, everyone.